So chapter 10 is about discrimination uh, and affirmative action. I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Maybe I should have given you a heads up with chapter 9 because there's people that are like, wait a minute, this assignment entails some advanced preparation and going out and fi figuring out who I'm going to talk to. And so if you're like me and you wait like the last minute to, to do your assignment and you're looking at it today, you're probably like, ah, oh, crap, i got to figure out who i got to go talk to. Um, so I will tell you that chapter 10's assignment involves, there's watching a video that is an hour long. Okay, so you need to plan for that. So you can set, a, I know, an hour. It's unbelievable. Uh, you guys watch like shows on Netflix that are an hour long, okay? I I believe it's a very interesting hour um, I, and time well spent. Um, but if you have to, you can break it up into uh, 10 six-minute segments <laughs> or whatever fits your, did I tell you about my daughter the other day? We we're gonna watch Dick do a little. Her brother was gonna do a little lesson for the family, and he like he's like, okay. I'm gonna show you this video, and then she's like, how long is it? And he goes, 14 minutes, and she goes, gross. <laughs> like like apparently watching 14 minutes is just way too much to ask of anybody. Um, so anyway, so so I'm just I'm warning you ahead. Like you may need to like some advanced preparation to realize there's an hour long video involved in the in in the in the coursework for this week. Um, remember. It's a hybrid course in the sense that we're, there's times we'll do stuff outside of class that takes a little more time than, than a regular course. I've still tried to make this pretty manageable. I don't think it's been horrible, has it? Like, I don't think it's as busy as 233 is, and that's a 16-week course. So it will cover 8, 9, and 10, and we're starting 10 today. All right. I'm glad you're happy about it. All right. So I think I asked this question of you before. I should sit in this chair. I will pontificate to you. Um, so the word discrimination in our society is like this super loaded word, right? And we're taught from the time we're little that discrimination is bad. We don't discriminate. And certainly certain types of discrimination are bad, right? You know, but can you think of scenarios in your life where you have to discriminate? And doing so is not only not bad, but it's necessary for survival or for safety or for other things. Can you think of a scenario where that's the case? Okay. When you choose a spouse, a potential spouse, do you not discriminate? And I'm not talking necessarily racial discrimination or, I mean, or maybe though, some people probably do. Some people probably have a preconceived notion that they want to marry someone of the same race as them. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying some people probably do. But what sort of things might you discriminate in a potential spouse that probably nobody would have a problem with? What sorts of things? Cleanliness? Okay, that it should be similar to yours in some way, or you know, some, you can, a person you could live with, a city girl or a country girl. Okay, yeah. So yeah, lifestyle is probably a broader way of, of saying that. Um, and people marry other people from different lifestyles, and it works for them sometimes. But those are things that we probably discriminate. How about their desire to have children or not? You know. I, I'm married to to a girl who had, she's one of eight kids. I have one sibling. Well, guess how many kids I have? I have nine. Uh, that was way outside of what I ever thought of. But in her, that's a norm in her family. She comes from, you know, lots of big families. Um, luckily, I, I, I really, you know, I love being a dad, and I think that's kind of the most, the only only important thing I really do. Everything else is just kind of incidental to that, right? I teach so that I have money so that I can raise a family, um, even though I love teaching too. I love you guys. Right there, okay. So we discriminate. One time, I probably told some of you this story, I was in Houston with my wife, and we were walking down a, a, a city street, and uh, you know, when you're in the nice downtown area, everything's kept really nice, there's a large police presence. Well, we got we got a little outside of that area, and I uh, and it was not as nice, the part of town we were in. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't as nice. 
And uh, walking up the street toward us um, was a black man dressed in ratty looking clothes, um, dressed like he was homeless. And without thinking, my wife was walking on this side of me. I was walking near the traffic. And this man was walking on the side of the sidewalk closest to her. I took my wife's hand. I passed it to this hand. And I pulled her to this side of me. And I put myself between her and this guy. And later, reflecting on that, I thought, I think I'm a racist. I'm a terrible person, right? And I and I'd been like like reflecting on it for the whole rest of that week, like why you know why did I do that? And then the last day we were in Houston, we're walking in another part of town, and this man is approaching us. This time it's a white guy, just like he's homeless. And guess what I do without thinking? I do the exact same thing, and it occurred to me I was perceiving threat, and it was in and it was independent of race. It had more to do with the, and then I like, and then like my eyes opened and I realized I'd been passing people of all different colors, backgrounds, races throughout the whole weekend and only had that reaction to the guy who looked homeless. So I'm like a, a, a homeless, uh, what? Homelessist more than I'm a racist. You got a fire? All right, be careful. All right. And I think a lot of these things are deep-seated in us. We do them without thinking. Do I think that all homeless people are bad? No. Do I think that a person who's dressed roughly is a higher threat to me and mine than a person who's dressed in a suit? Because I passed black men and Hispanic men and white men and women dressed in suits, dressed for work, and never thought anything of it. I think most of us have threat perception radar almost, you know, like there's times when we feel threatened and then we respond accordingly. And it's hard to change that, even if you're trying to say, I don't want to be a racist or I don't want to be, you know. Um, so I was glad to find out that apparently I'm not racist, I just hate homeless people, um, which is not true either, but that I was perceiving a threat. So this idea of discrimination and victimization can be really challenging. Because a lot of the things we have going on within us are more subtle than overt racism. And it's not like we chose to feel that way. We just feel threatened in that situation. And so that, that subtle bias is sometimes the hardest one to deal with because you don't even realize it's there until it crops up. And then you go, what started that? So the book gives this definition of racial discrimination. And I think that this is really a, a narrow definition for the workplace. Okay. So it has to be an employment decision that affects an employee or applicant either adversely or positively. Right? Either one of those two things could be discrimination. And it's based upon their membership in a certain racial group rather than their uh, ability or, or background or accomplishment, I think is what they use in the book. And it rests on unverified or unreasonable stereotypes of the racial group. So that's their definition. I bet you some people in this room have been victims of this and, and some have been beneficiaries of this. Maybe not in a super noticeable way, but in subtle ways. There's a few ways if we want to figure out if the organization that we're working with has uh, a bias, because again, it's not always easy to see. The first is what's called experimental. That would be where you set up an experiment and see. Like, if say you work for a large organization, you work for the city, I work for EAC, those are fairly large for our community, they're not big organizations in a worldwide sense. If you work for Walmart, you work for the largest employer in the world, I believe. Um, but uh, maybe you set up an experiment where you take actors of different racial backgrounds, you give them identical resumes, you have them go to various local parts of your business and apply. And then see if people get more callbacks. 
And especially if you do that in, in large numbers and with, with lots of trials, you might be able to see if there's a systematic bias in the system. I've seen one they've done pretty recently where they, 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 just, they did emailed in resumes like on job sites, but they gave people names that sounded really ethnic, right? Uh, like La Fonda or, you know, like, sorry, that's from, what movie is that? La Fonda was Kip's girlfriend on Napoleon Dynamite. That's right. Um, and so that's an experimental way to sort of root out and see, are we, do we have bias here? Because a lot of times um, people don't realize they have bias. They think that they're being very non-biased. Um, and so when you have large amounts of data that show consistently you know, there's an advantage to someone for being white, that can tell you you have a problem. Right now here at EAC, at our last, our last accreditation visit, one of their findings was that we have a lack of diversity here at EAC. And you're like, well, good thing you came out to figure that out, right? Like, and so when we all sat down in the room to talk about it, there were some people who were really offended at that. They were like, we try really hard to be open to everybody here at EAC. How dare them say that? We don't have a problem with diversity here. And then I looked around the room of the people who were discussing the potential diversity problem, and can you guess what? There was 14 of us, and we were all white. And you're like, hmm. You know, we have no diversity problem, says the room of 14 white people, right? Like... Is it possible that that group of people are blinded to, to the plight of, the, of, of a minority student or employee here? It's possible. Is it also possible, though, that we do a pretty good job of including everybody and that just that one group that day happened to, you know, that's possible, too. And so you don't want to, like, say we're going to change everything. We're going to say this gives us enough that we should start looking into this. Because then guess what the challenge was after that? Then we said, you know what we need to do? Let's create a committee of people who can look at this. And so guess what people start doing on the committee? Well, let's see. Who do we have here that's a minority? So that we could put them on this committee, right? And what's hard about that is you kind of had to do that. You had to say, this affects minorities, and so we should give our minority employees a chance to be heard and to be involved in the process of, of fixing this challenge. But then we're singling them out. Like, oh, this person's brown. We could put them on the committee. So that's a real challenge for an organization, even for an organization who's trying to be to trying to trying to do something about it. It's it's like this awkward thing to talk about and, and and deal with. So another way we can look at it is through statistical. One thing we've been looking at here at EAC is uh, what is the the um, the racial breakup of our community that we serve, and then do our student body numbers reflect that? You know, so if if our community is uh, is 20 percent, or let's say 35 percent Hispanic, do our, does our student population is it roughly that? And if it's if it's significantly lower than that, then why? Right? Are we are we providing equal opportunity to everybody, or are we systematically somehow not? Now, pretty easy here at EAC, like. People don't not get into EAC, so if we have a group of people not here, it's because they're choosing not to apply. So rather than saying, are we, are we not letting certain groups in, we have to say, are we not reaching people with our marketing in a way that, that is uh, encouraging them to come? But So that's a way we can look at statistics and say, do we seem to match the demographics of the community? And if we're not matching them, then why is that? Or you know, if we look at our incoming freshman class, and then we look at our completers, do we have groups of people who are who are completing at at better rates or worse rates than others? And if so, why? Is there systematic bias? Is there some support we should be providing to to make the opportunity more equal? So these are things we're trying to do here at EIC. And then episodic would just be like you have this moment where there's some sort of racial bias or racial discrimination, and you look at that and you say, okay, is that indicative of the norm here, or is that more like a one-off thing because guess what sometimes even if the institution is doing everything in their in their power to combat discrimination they're still individuals that make up the organization right 
And so there's still somebody who will say something insensitive or who will act in a way that's discriminatory. You can't always stop that. So from a legal standpoint, what you do is if that happens, you have to respond swiftly and decisively. And that doesn't mean you have to fire the person. It means you have to say, hey, you're not in line with our policies and procedures. Let's get you some training and make sure this isn't a pattern. And then if that individual continues to do it over and over, then you may have to say, look, you're not in line with what we're doing. Um, so that's what they mean by institutional versus individual. When you have discrimination and you recognize it, the question is, is this a one-off thing or is this an organization-wide issue? Isolated versus regularized, same thing. Okay, Is this the norm here or is this something that happens once? And then unintentional versus intentional. What do you think might be unintentional bias versus intentional bias or unintentional discrimination versus intentional discrimination? What do you think that means? What, what does unintentional mean? Not on purpose, right? Do you think we live in a world that's very tolerant of accidental things right now? Depends on what the thing is, right? But certainly with things like political correctness and bias, sometimes people could like make an honest mistake. And so think of this one. Someone sees a new person at work, that person looks Asian, and they walk up to him and say, so are you like, are you Chinese or are you Korean? And the person's like, um, I'm from California, right? Or whatever. <laughs> that was probably not someone trying to be like a racist, but it probably was kind of rooted in some sort of like basic ignorance that because someone has Asian features, they're somehow less American than you are. Their family could have been here as many generations as your family's been here, right? Or like, or whatever. I think that's a form of unintentional discrimination that can make the one person feel like, man, they're looking at me like, you know, or the idea that all Asians are good at math or bad drivers or women are bad drivers or all these things that people say, right? All men are insensitive louts. They're like, well, okay. Um, whereas intentional is when someone is like legitimately going after somebody because of their their race or background or gender or whatever okay and so these things matter at when you're management and you're trying to decide what do I do with this situation and how do I fix this situation how do I make sure everybody that works here feels like they're they're part of the same team because the last thing you want is that is is having a group of people who feel unwelcome unloved unneeded uh, at your organization so from the legal side Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's a biggie. It'll come up in business law. It'll come up in other classes. In essence, the, title, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 makes it illegal to discriminate against people on the basis of their membership in a protected class. And in 1964, those were the protected classes specifically listed in the statute. Race, color, national origin, religion, and gender or sex. Many states have added addendums for sexual orientation and gender identity. Additional federal legislation has added age. And um, is that it? So you can't discriminate based on those. The challenge we talked about already is we are in a uh, like a right to work state. So I don't have to say I'm not hiring you because you're Mexican. I could just say I'm not hiring you. Do you feel singled out? I looked at you. <laughs> you're half. So, so you're half fired. Right. Well, it's an interesting thing that this is such a thing, right? Because like race is kind of like we're all. It, I think probably the differences based on race are more cultural things than they are racial things, actually. Like, I think if you were to strip down the, the culture, 
race doesn't make us that much different from each other. Maybe the, the hair color or skin color a little bit, but not so much different in other ways. It's cultural differences that, that I think a lot of people, when they have the sense of bias, it's because they don't understand the culture. I'll give you an example. When I first started teaching here at EAC, I thought that my Native American students were being rude because they would not look me in the eye when they talked to me. They would avert their eyes down and away. And when I was, so when I was serving on, on the, the Bilas Economic Development Foundation board, I finally had a friend named Jonathan Kitchen, who's a, who's a, do you know Jonathan? Uh, he was a cop at the time. Is he still working for? No, he he was on. No, and he you know he was he had been a cop, but he was a councilman. He'd just become a councilman. And I said, and so I knew him pretty well. And I was like, Jonathan, why do my native students not look at me when I talk to him? He says they're showing you respect by they're showing you deference. They're recognizing you as sort of the authoritative figure in 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 that interchange. And so the same way they wouldn't stare their their grandmother or some elder in the face but would be deferent to her, they're being deferent to you. They're being respectful. And I was like, wow, I read that completely wrong, right? Because I was reading it by my cultural paradigm, which is like you look at somebody and you nod, and that shows I'm hearing you and I understand you and I respect what you say. But for them to do that in the way they were raised, it would have been almost like an aggressive gesture or something. And so... I think there's a lot of times we think that it's racial and it's it's more cultural. Um, nonetheless, you can't discriminate on people based on that. And yet, would that affect the way I would hire if I was interviewing an employee for a sales position and they wouldn't make eye contact with me and they they would talk kind of quiet and look away from me? I'd be like, this person can't help my customers. And so... I think for me, just getting some education on understanding in, in this situation helped me realize how to communicate better. Um, anyway, then the Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1972 created a, an organization called the EEOC, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which became like this enforcement agency for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and, and many of the other follow-on legislations. What that means is the government won't just wait for people to report it. They can actually go out and investigate issues of discrimination in the workplace. That's what the EEOC's job is. So both, if people report it, then they can investigate or they can just take up the case on their own. So that's, um, that's the legal side of it. So here's a couple of arguments against racial discrimination. The first is fairness-based that discrimination divides up opportunities in our community in an unacceptable way. Meaning certain groups of people are getting the better opportunities. That's especially a concern when you hear the other argument, which is like, you know, I believe in people just sort of picking themselves up and making something of themselves, which I think most of us agree with. The question is, do they have an equal opportunity to do that? or not because um, we, we love the story right we love the story of those guys of Ben Carson grew up a poor black kid in Detroit and through his mother forcing them to read and to learn he became a, a surgeon and right most of us love those stories of that kid who grew up disadvantaged and through hard work and determination became advantaged or whatever you want to call it um, but I you know I'm from Detroit and I got to tell you that kids who grow up inside, inside the eight mile loop are at a pretty significant disadvantage to the, to, to the kid who grows up here in Safford, Arizona, as far as their prospects for the future, their prospects of not being involved in a gang. Um, um, they're far more likely to be killed before they're 20 than a kid who grows up here in Safford, uh, and certainly far less likely to earn a college degree. Um, and it's hard to believe completely that it's just because they're lazy and indolent. Um, so if opportunity really isn't fair, then that's kind of what, what uh, that argument's getting to. So John Rawls, who was a, a philosopher, he said the way you can tell if something is moral or not is to pretend that each of us before 
we were born, before we were assigned our lot in life, whether it was to grow up inside the eight-mile ring around Detroit. And see, I lived here, and my dad lived in Detroit. And so I would go back during the summers. My dad lived right off of Seven Mile, so we were inside the ring in a pretty rough neighborhood. And so I had, like, all the advantage of growing up in this rural community where it's, I, you know, and then I would go there in the summers and be like, oh, man, I just don't want to get killed here. Like, seriously, there was shooting and violence. My father's house was broken into seven times. Many houses in our neighborhood were just set on fire, right? Like, if, if people that thought no one was living there, they'd just burn it down. Uh, and And so I had this different kind of view of it, like, you know, survive for six weeks out of the summer until I go back home with my mom. Um, and so I don't, I never got to be a tough city kid. I just, but you know, I, I had friends who lived one block outside, you cross the freeway you're in, and you're in a much nicer neighborhood. That's how a lot of these inner city areas are. Um, and, and there was much worse neighborhoods than where my dad was too further into Detroit. Um, but I, you know, I would walk around and stuff out there and, 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 you know, this chubby little white kid from Arizona that didn't know the terrain, right? Anyway, John Rawl says, if we would make these decisions about what is fair, it's about fairness, from behind a veil of ignorance. So if we all got together, we didn't know what our race would be. We didn't know what our socioeconomic status would be. But we knew that we would each get assigned to one of these randomly, let's say. And if we made the decision at that stage about what was fair, not knowing if we were going to end up on the winning side of it, the wealthy, you know, wealthy kid from the suburbs, or the inner city kid, that's the only real way to make decisions of fairness, is from within a veil of ignorance. Rawls actually had a pretty fascinating way of thinking about things. What would I consider? How should black people be treated if I didn't know I was going to be black or white or some other race? Would that change the way I feel about how black people should be treated? Probably. I'd want everybody to have an equal chance, right? That way, if I ended up black, I would have as equal a chance as the white kid or the Native American kid or the Hispanic kid, if we're singling out. Okay. So that's Rawls' veil of ignorance. The second argument against... Discrimination contradicts basic human rights. We could argue this one, right? What are basic human rights? Can we agree on what the basic human rights are? Tell me what they are. What do you have a right to? What do you, by virtue of being born, what do you have a right to? Your life. So nobody else should be able to deprive you of your life. We might come up with some limitations for the death penalty or something. But even then, right, we might have a hard time arguing that. So life. What else? Okay, so the pursuit of happiness, meaning the right to pursue what you want. So freedom, maybe, or at least freedom within some kind of reason, because if that freedom starts to infringe on the rights of others, we have a problem. We're going back to like John Locke here, guys. We're going back to the framers of, of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the people they read, right? These are the things. You get down to this list, and it's not a super deep list. Some people believe we have a right to housing, that the government should ensure everybody has safe, adequate housing. Some people believe we have a right to education. And in our country, you kind of do, right? It's compulsory. You not only have a right to education, you are required to be educated to some basic certain level. But that right doesn't necessarily speak to the, the, the less legalistic side of it, which is like, well, to what level are you educated and how? And 
And is it owed to you? Uh-huh. Right. Maybe it's an important story to tell so that we can make sure that doesn't happen again. Right. But see, wound up in this one, isn't that the argument that someone who's <coughs> transgendered is making? Why well, can't, you know, remember Lila? from our video. Lila, Lila's argument, I'm not trying to twist your argument, but I'm saying Lila's argument was it's not okay for them to say I have to use the gender neutral bathroom because I just want to be who I am. And to be put there makes, puts me into this category of being nothing, being neutral. I'm not nothing, I'm a girl. And this is where these things become you know, difficult, right? Like we can look at your scenario and say, that's terrible. These kids were raised speaking a certain language in their home, and all of a sudden at the school they're getting beat if they, speak, you know, if they don't speak anything but English. And, you know, and we're thinking, we don't want to never have that problem again. But then it's harder when we have someone who says, well, my right to be who I am is being infringed when I can't go to the bathroom with your daughters. Because I'm a girl too. And can't we almost, can't we twist a lot of things like that? Like what really is a, a right of freedom? Most of us, would, so what would you say? How do you define freedom? Maybe there's our problem. Right? Can you drive as fast as you want? Why not? Why should the government be able to tell you how fast you can drive? Okay. How about, do you have to wear a seatbelt? Why does the government have the right to tell you you have to wear a seatbelt? Wait. Is there a significant difference between endangering the lives of others and endangering your own life? It becomes muddy at some point. Just like if the government can say, let's say we agree the government can't make me protect my own life, can they make me protect my, own, my children's lives? Like say that you have to put your kids in a car seat. Or if you're under 18, they can't ride in the back of a truck because it's dangerous. Because as soon as you concede that they have some right over your children that they don't have over you, you in essence gave ownership of your children away to the government at least in some limited form. And that's why these aren't easy. I'm not trying to like trick you guys into some sort of question, okay? It's hard though, right? As soon as you say the government's allowed to tell me I have to buckle my seatbelt because they have some stake in my life, then you also say the government says like you can't kill yourself, which it does in most states. And you're like, prosecute me, sucker, I'm dead, right? But it's actually only against the law to attempt suicide because if, you, if you're successful, you're outside of the law at that point, right? All right. And then utilitarian arguments for racial or against racial discrimination is that discrimination reduces economic productivity. By limiting certain groups of people to certain jobs, we may be missing out on you know, the great minds who are going to solve the great problems. And I think that one, to me, is one of the most compelling arguments, right? You know, Einstein was a Jew, and if he'd stayed in Nazi Germany, we may not have had all the things that we had from him. Maybe we would, I don't know. But to put these artificial limitations based on race 
seems like a really bad idea for overall happiness and productivity over time. And I, I like that argument personally. So we know that race isn't the only way people discriminate. So then there's another section on gender discrimination, which if you look at it, is almost the exact same definition, except it's based on gender rather than race. Um, so there's a large discussion in the text about occupational segregation. And what they mean by that is that there are certain jobs that women gravitate to and certain jobs that men gravitate to. Not because anybody forced them to. So even in a free society, more than 90% of, of dental hygienists are women. More than 90% of cosmetologists are women. And the question is, why? Is it because of discrimination or is it because certain people choose certain things in their life? You guys have any thoughts of that, on that? Why occupational segregation happens? How dare you, you bigot. I'm teasing you. Some jobs, I mean, you mentioned those jobs that aren't I mentioned those jobs, I sure did. That aren't, like, that aren't laborious necessarily, but I mean, like, like labor jobs where there's lots of people lifting, like, men will build those occupations because generally, Okay, so is that, is that an act of discrimination? Is that self-determination? Like women say, I'm not interested in jobs that have lots of heavy lifting. More often than men will say that. Or is it something different? What do you think? Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. So in her case, it was discrimination. It was employers or master's programs saying, eh, women don't really do this job. And then they're not being able to get in. And I think most people would say that this, is, this happens less now than it did in the 1960s, where I think if a woman wants to get into medical school or accountant school, they probably have a, a, a more fair chance of doing that now than they did in the past. But not always, right? There might still be discrimination there. And so the answer is probably some of both, right? There's some truth to that. Data, I mean, and that's the, right now, the data will tell you that, that more, college, more women are graduating from college than men. Mm -hmm. a, a flip, and that's true. Just go look at our, our autos program. There'll be one or two females for 20 males. But again, is it partially because, I mean, do you think that Brian Coppola, if anybody knows Brian, is like, you're a girl, you don't belong here? Probably not. Brian's pretty, pretty open with any student. But do you think that there's broader social sort of pressures for women to stay away from mechanicking? Maybe, you know? Yeah, sometimes there's one in a class, but it's pretty rare. But why are guys not choosing it? In cosmetology, right, so is that is that discrimination or bias? Is that, what is that? And who's at fault? Are our parents all terrible people for giving Barbies to their daughters? Or, for, I mean, or is it just how it is? See, I think a lot of times when I hear about discrimination, I want to say, who are you mad at? Like, because there's a, there's a broader social issue, right? 
And I'm like, whose fault is that? It's just sort of this perpetuation of what we've always done. But then, of course, there's individual cases where you have legitimate, like, this is discrimination and we need to handle it. And that's a challenge. What were you going to say? I'm sorry, April. Right. And do you think he babies you because he thinks women are incapable? Or do you think he babies you because... And is it possible that he's now in an, a different era where he's like, I want to make sure my female student's successful so that nobody thinks that I'm being biased against females, right? Like, that all exists. That's why this is, like, a complex problem. Like, people are trying to be helpful, but they're doing it, they're overdoing it because they're trying to compensate. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you observed that most men had tr problems doing a job that, that women were doing well. Mm -hmm. So, so that gets us to this question, which is like the elephant in the room always when we discuss discrimination, which is, are there certain genders or certain, certain jobs that, that, that certain genders are more predisposed to? Because that's a dangerous thing to, to talk about or, or say, you know, well, this is just a job that men are good at. Actually, you could probably say that's a job that women are good at and nobody will get too offended. But if you did it the other way, and especially if you say didn't hire someone on the basis of like, well, you're a woman and this is kind of a man's job, you'd be in trouble, right? You, you could get sued or have the EEOC come after you. Um, and so anytime we sort of assign something based on a, on a role that's preconceived, we're in danger of violating the law. Even if our observations have led us to sort of believe that for a long time, that's a real challenge. Um, special case of motherhood, real quick. Right now in our area, so here at the college, we have, so in the business division, we have four male instructors, five male instructors, three female. Almost all of our male instructors make more than our female instructors, which led us to ask the question, why? The ways you make more money here at EAC is either you do the job longer, those are longevity steps, they're called, or you have a higher level of education, credits beyond your master's degree. That's it. Or you work overload, which is taking on classes over and above your required load. And what we've found is that the women in our department choose not to pursue additional educational credits because they're doing other things with their life, like being moms. They also choose not to take as much overload as the men because you know they want to have a job where they get off at three when their kids get off and be home for them and so this is not some systemic thing where we're saying women don't get paid as much but the women more often are opting for family over money and the men are opting i'm going to bring home as much money as we can and that's the case i'm in jacked up my education i take on as much overload as i can because i have a wife who's a stay-at-home mom and so I'm trying to provide for, for the whole family, right? And I think that this is not that unusual of a circumstance. I see lots of head noddings, especially from the working moms, uh, who are, are saying, you know, sometimes my time is worth more than money, like getting home to spend some time with my kids or, or there's roles I'm still expected to perform at home, even though I'm making as much as he is, that jerk, uh, or whatever. So this is a real issue in our society, too and something that employers or organizational leaders need to be sensitive to. Okay, so there's one like, there's two last little things we're about out of time, um, but the one, the real question I want to ask you to consider is, what is a minority? 
because there's lots of people that get discriminated against for lots of things. I think the book says somewhere out there there's probably a senior executive who thinks people with knobby knees can't be good at doing a certain job. Like you could discriminate on all sorts of things, right? So what really is a minority and what really is a victim? Which I think comes back to a lot of what really what rights do we really have? And and are they being violated? Because sometimes People just don't like something. That's not the same as stealing your rights away, right? Um, and then the last thing, and so this is the video I want you to watch, is about affirmative action. And affirmative action is controversial because it's an, an attempt to correct discrimination through proactive means. In its most aggressive form, it involves quotas. Like if, so if, let's say we were to say, hey, our community is 30% is, uh, Hispanic. We would say, we're going to hire and make sure 30% of our employee base is Hispanic. That's a, a quota-based system. 6% of our community is, is Native American. We're going to hire and make sure that 6% at least of our employees are Native American. That's a pretty aggressive thing to actually try to do. It's, it's hard to do. Less aggressive ways are like to offer incentives, right? Like maybe we'll give bonus points on the hiring process for people who fit into these categories. Even a little less aggressive would be like a tie goes to the minority, which sounds really bad to me, but that's, that's in essence, if we find two people that are similarly qualified, we'll give the job to the minority. Um, and then, you know, the least aggressive would just be to say, let's ensure our process is completely open and everybody has just as fair of a chance, but no advantage to anybody based on uh, race or other things. Some people say it's necessary because discrimination is so ingrained in our society that we've got we've to do this so that, that people get a chance. But the other side of that is, is that it's discriminatory. You're still using race as a basis for hiring. You're just doing it for this race and not this race. People say it can reduce tensions at work. Other people say it creates tension at work. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? So-and-so just got the job because they were X, whatever. They were a woman. Or have you ever heard someone say, well, it looks like they filled their quota. Or something along those lines. I, I hear people say things like that. My friends that work at the mine, you know. Well, I know why that guy got the job. He was just filling a quota. And if you think about it, that statement's pretty racist. And yet, it's coming out of the fact that he feels that he got, like, passed over. And this other guy got it only because of his race. So it created this tension, right? Um, but if it had been the other way around, it would have had tension from the other side. So it's the real challenge of doing this. No, exactly. No one's ever going to be happy. Um, and then the big argument in favor is that it compensates for past wrongs. This group's been historically disadvantaged, so we're going to give them an advantage now to equal things out. And of course, the counter argument is it doesn't compensate for past wrongs because it makes people who were racist 100 years ago makes me somehow who's, I don't feel like I am racist, I have to pay for it now. How does that compensate? How does the fact that your great-grandfather was hurt mean you should get an advantage today? And of course, the counter-argument to that is, well, because he was hurt, our family's been disadvantaged this whole time, and we're trying to rectify that. So it's just not an easy thing. And that's so I want you to watch that video. Um, we're out of time. I appreciate 